Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome. Thank you, parents, for being here with your, with your children in the choir. Um, May 7th and May 8th, uh, there is a trip being planned for uh, the Creation Museum. Sign up for that is in the narthex. Uh, order of service today is Divine Service Setting 2, page 167. Opening hymn, Blessed Jesus at Your Word, 904. <coughs>
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you in our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. He's called an ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. O Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save. Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
On it you shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear fault witnesses against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. We read Psalm 19 responsively by whole verse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and, like a strong man, runs its course with joy. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were noble of birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord.
mercy and peace be unto you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the Epistle Lesson, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We hear again verses 23 through 24, the contrast of wisdom and power. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Here ends our text. Dear Christian friends, is this going to work? Oh, we start saying that phrase early on in life, don't we? Is this going to work? All of us who are not the oldest in the family, I'm the second of two, we grew up asking that of our siblings, didn't we? They concocted some plan, some obstacle course, some toboggan run, some something that you ask, is this going to work? And I can hear my sister saying, oh yeah, but you go first. <laughs> you know, we know how this is. It keeps on going at work, doesn't it? They hand you a new form. They take away your familiar way of doing stuff. They give you new software. They take away whatever it is you're used to and say, here, we're doing it this way. How do you not ask, is this going to work? And at our place, they say, it should, which is about as encouraging as hearing your sister say, you go first. I always want to ask, do we save the old stuff? No, 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 the old stuff is gone. This should work. That's a great phrase for our text, isn't it? Is this going to work? Can you hear the world asking us, is this going to work? Because Paul right away says, we offer them a message that to their hearing is weak and foolish. And yet we insist is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know, there's times when we'll join those who ask, is this going to work? Because the gospel of Christ crucified is so out of ordinary. Maybe we have the same question as the world around us. So let's ourselves and let the world ask, is this going to work? And God smiles and says, the wisdom of God, the power of God are greater than those of men. Let's see how it goes. We're going to start with power. Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, and then later on, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So let's make an equation fairly simple. That signs equals power, that's what's being sought. And how would you define power? I'm going to make it really a simple thing. We seek an appraised power that is greater than that which we know, but it's a multiplication of what we already know. Oh, it makes simpler than this. Fifth grade. Our son Steve and his friend Mike are in the front or in, the, in a driveway shooting baskets. That sounds simple, doesn't it? But they'd like to be able to dunk the basketball at a 10-foot height. That's where the you know the standard is. They're in fifth grade. Well, what do they do? They don't have enough power to just launch themselves out there. Oh, and by the way, in college they're going to be a FIED major and a mechanical engineer. So they should come up with something between the two of them. Shouldn't this work? So they go in the garage. By the way, I'm not home, so I'm washing my hands of this whole thing. They drag out a three-foot step ladder. They try that. It doesn't work. What's the natural next step if you're looking for power? A six-foot step ladder, exactly. I don't know if they ever dunked the basketball. I do know Steve broke his arm that day. <laughs> Honestly. Power. If this doesn't work, we'll just add more to it. You know, I grew up on a farm, as you know, and my dad was a wonderful mechanic. And this literally is dad's ball-peen hammer. And this would be about the extent of the force we'd use to tap, 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 tap something into place. If dad got really frustrated, he would say, Danny, go get the big hammer. <laughs> we didn't really have a big hammer. And my dad wouldn't have been that kind of mechanic. But there were moments when he just wanted that idea. Why don't we just beat this thing into its place? That's our definition of power. Is I have what I have, and I should have more. When we go to God, wouldn't we expect that to be his definition? God, I know the power I have, and if I need more, well, you must be just a multiplication of that. And sometimes that's how God works. Think about the early ministry of Jesus. Isn't it some ways exactly that? Here we have a carpenter, a teacher, but he has power multiplied over us. He is a carpenter who can quiet a storm. 
with just a word. He's a healer who, if he touches a leper, he's instantly well. He can make a blind man see, a deaf man hear, paralyzed men walk, and even the dead are raised. Now that's a multiplication of power. Sounds wonderful to us, doesn't it? Until you get to the heart of the gospel, which is Christ crucified. Isn't that the mystery of our text? For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those being saved, it's the power of God. But think about that. If power is more than what we have, if power is getting the big hammer and doing works that you and I can't imagine, then what power is it when he puts the hammer not in his hand, but in the hands of others? When nails are taken up not in his hand, but in theirs, and then through his. And the world shakes its head and says, that's weak. That's not power. But we know it is. Now, if we're right, that's going to take some new kind of thinking. That's going to take a new measure of wisdom, won't it? And that's exactly where the next part goes. Because if we go back to verse 22, for the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. So if we're right that there is power in giving the hammer into his enemy's hands. And how does that make any sense? Well, let's take on wisdom. Then. So what is wisdom? Oh, all kinds of definitions for that, aren't there? Let's use this one very simple, and I know you've heard it. Wisdom is seeing associations, others miss. Wisdom is saying this is like that. Oh. Now for that, how do you beat Betty Crocker? <laughs> Betty Crocker. 1975. I asked Holly to find in here because I knew they were there. The equivalence, the wisdom of Betty Crocker that says, if you don't have this, this will do. I bet you you could all fill in this whole page. If you don't, oh, this could be kind of fun. If you don't have uh, flour, what do you use? Cornstarch, exactly. You have cornstarch, absolutely. Oh, this one's too easy. If you don't have honey, you use one and a quarter cup sugar plus one half cup of liquid, and Betty doesn't tell you what the liquid is, but I guess that's up to you. Uh, no, no, no. Well, there, it goes on and on, as you would guess. And don't those make sense? Let's see, I don't have cornstarch. I'll use flour, white, powdery stuff. It makes sense. I don't have honey. I'll use sugar, sweet stuff. That makes sense. Here's my favorite. Betty wants you to make blueberry, uh, excuse me, well, those would be good, too. Um, buttermilk waffles. Yeah, but who really has buttermilk just sitting around? Uh, sitting around fresh enough to actually still use. It's in the back there somewhere, but don't, don't, don't. <laughs> well, Betty has this substitution. Did you see this one coming? The substitute for buttermilk. Now, you're expecting milk, aren't you? No, no. To substitute buttermilk, separate eggs, beat the egg whites stiff, increase baking powder to four teaspoons, omit soda, Hold egg whites into batter. I'm not kidding. I read that straight out. Did you see that one coming? No, I didn't either. I bet it works. It's Betty Crocker, after all. That's wisdom. That's an association that, left to ourselves, we'd never make. At least I would. What's the wisdom of God? What are we looking for? What are we looking to increase? What do we not have enough, and we need a at least reasonable substitute of it. I'm going to suggest that when we come into relationship with God, we're looking for the love of God and enough holiness to somehow be in his presence. And I'll bet you we often put those two together. That if I were found righteous enough in his sight, he would love me. You know, it's our nature, isn't it, to have love as a conditional quality. I'll be loved if. You'll love me if or when. When we come near to God, I wonder if we don't bring those two together and that's what we're looking for. If God would find me good enough, he'd love me. And that's the relationship I'm looking for. Well, since we don't have enough of that in ourselves, I mean, think of it. Open the cupboards and 
They're kind of bare. Episodes, do we have enough righteousness? Do we have enough innate love that God would love us? No. We need a substitute. So what substitutes would we find? Here again, we baffle the world. We hold up, first of all, we might, Jesus himself, who has wonderful words about love and care. Words about love your enemy. Do good to those who hate you. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. All those words of love. But the short thing is, we don't do it enough. We could still open up the cupboard and look into our life and say, yeah, I don't think there's enough here. To cause God to love me because I did all those things. And that's when, again, this text comes up and says, make this connection. Make this connection. This is where you'll find the love of God. And this is where you'll find his acceptance. And once again, we read, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So what's the wisdom of the cross? What's the equation, the substitute? We're looking for holiness. You'd imagine that you find holiness as an overflow from a holy God. Where do we find holiness? We find holiness with a criminal. We find holiness in a cross. We find our assurance of righteousness in a man on whom all the sins of the world are piled. Isn't that a strange place to find righteousness? We're looking for love. And to quote that old 80s country song, left to ourselves, we're looking for love in all the wrong places. Go instead to this place. Look for love not in some perfect meadow, some mountain in full sunshine. Christ crucified. But you say, but he doesn't look love. He's not. Find love when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that moment, we are. Isn't that a strange thing? Think of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Did you hear that equation? God so loved us that he gave his son. And we know that verb gave is more than that. He gave his son to die. He gave his son to cry out, why am I forsaken? But in that, we're love. It's a strange place to find love, isn't it? It's a strange scene to say, now I know I'm love. It's a strange place to say, God accepts me, not because of me, but because of what's done to his son. Go to his son and hear him cry, why am I forsaken? And know where all the sins of the world have gone. On him. Paul says that so well. For God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that's the substitution. It's a strange place, isn't it? To find love, and holiness, and the darkness of Good Friday. But that's where it is. And when we put those together, then we've got the message Paul said. Now we find a God who in this strange equation of his son crucified, his son forsaken, there's the power of God and the wisdom of God. You can hear Paul say it again. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I think the world will always continue to ask us, is this going to work? And we smile and say, it does. It's worked for us. It's worked for the ages. It's the, in fact, only way God works, is to say, and so, you want to see me in power? I take up not a huge hammer of justice, but I give the hammer into the hands of my enemies and I let them kill my son. That's power. Do you want to find wisdom? Wisdom sufficient to find love and holiness 
enough for you? Then look to my son as he cries out under the sins of the world. No, you are loved because of him. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand to confess our faith, the Apostles' Creed, page 175. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the world. In our prayers, we pray for those who are sick, for Lynn Troike, Rick Allerman, David Pedersen, Gail Groth, Landon Zellick, Ashley Abel, Joanne Dahmer, and Christopher McKinnon, who is in uh, the ICU right now. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For true wisdom in Christ, that the faithful may recognize that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church throughout the world and for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a true zeal for the gospel, that all Christians may recognize the privilege it is to share Christ and comfort others with the comfort we have received. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a daily return to baptism, repentance, and sorrow for sin, that the old Adam in us should be drowned and die with all evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy those who have wandered from the faith, that the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have been given positions of public trust, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honorably and for the good of the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who serve in worthy occupations, professions, arts, and sciences, that God would grant them skill and integrity in the performance of their responsibilities and valued service through their vocations. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, or unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are hospitalized, recovering from surgery, facing chronic pain or long-term health problems, and all who suffer as a result of living in a fallen world, that God would grant them mercy and perseverance, as well as healing according to his good and gracious will. Let us pray to the Lord. And for those who mourn, that in their time of sorrow they would not lose hope, but rely on God's promise that he will never leave them or forsake them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Lift up your hearts, lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly grace. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, the lasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you've had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the olive alien sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, and this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you've given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.